This BBC article got my attention a few days ago as it suggested that some of the most populated regions of our planet could literally become uninhabitable at times by the latter part of this century. It's based on this paper that deals with the issue of heat and humidity, and the suggestion that if we continue to emit greenhouse gases at a high rate, then parts of the Indian subcontinent will at times become too hot and humid by the end of the 21st century to survive outside for long periods of time. So it is claimed that we will effectively be reaching a limit of human survivability in these areas. This is a very interesting and concerning issue that crosses climate, social and medical science, so I'm taking a quick look at this video at where this idea has come from and how concerning these predictions may be. First of all, the Indian subcontinent usually includes Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan and Sri Lanka, and taken together this region has a population of 1.71 billion people, which is more than five times the population of the United States and 2.3 times the entire population of Europe and four times the population of South America. I could go on with unfathomable comparisons, but suffice to say, there are a huge number of people living in this region. The United Nations projections for India's population through the rest of this century show a lot of uncertainty with the red and green lines representing the high and low population scenarios. However, the blue is the middle of the road guess, known as the medium variant, the middle of the range of estimated populations, and at this point it's our best guess. This projection keeps India's population below 2 billion and by the mid-21st century, the population begins to level off and then slowly declines. The Bangladesh projection also peaks mid-century, however, Pakistan's population continues to climb throughout. Taken together, these three countries today have a population of about 1.7 billion, and by 2100, it is projected by this medium variant to be 2.04 billion. So there are projected to be a huge number of people in the region, although not a hugely dramatic rise over today's population. Now the study in question is suggesting that areas such as the Ganges Basin and Bangladesh, where population density is especially high, could be impacted by conditions that will be able to kill you within hours, and it all comes down to a quantity known as the wet bulb temperature. So our first question is, what is this wet bulb temperature, and why is it being used as a measure of human survivability? Well, the wet bulb temperature is a measure that is dependent on both the temperature and the humidity. This is because the wet bulb temperature is the coldest temperature that air can attain by the evaporation of water. It's typically measured by spinning a thermometer with a wet wick attached, so it cools down as the water is evaporated by the wick. This instrument is known as a sling psychrometer. The human analogy is that it is a representation of how cool your skin can get by evaporation, as demonstrated by Nadal here. So the higher the wet bulb temperature, the less able you are to cool your body down by sweating. Specifically, it's claimed in the original article that human exposure to wet bulbs of around 35 Celsius for even a few hours will result in death, even for the fittest of humans under shaded, well-ventilated conditions. So the second question is, where does this 35 degrees Celsius wet bulb temperature value come from? It must surely have a medical source. So the reference used by the first paper for the justification of choosing this 35 Celsius wet bulb value as a limit of human survivability is the following paper by Sherwood and Huber. And it is not a medical paper, but another climate one. Sherwood and Huber here state that the human body's core temperature is near 37 Celsius, but the temperature of the skin is strongly regulated near 35 Celsius. This temperature difference between the body core and the skin allows the metabolic heat that we generate to be transferred to the skin. They state that sustained skin temperatures above 35 Celsius imply elevated core body temperatures, which reach lethal values of 42 to 43 Celsius for skin temperatures of 37 to 38 Celsius. We would thus expect long periods at a wet bulb temperature of greater than 35 Celsius to be intolerable, quote. Now, Sherwood and Huber are actually considering a situation that is well ventilated and in the shade, so if you were to wander out into the sun and the conditions were calm, your body would presumably overheat even quicker. Now, this is where the 35 Celsius value comes from, because at a wet bulb temperature of above 35 Celsius, the skin would be unable to cool down to 35 Celsius by sweating. And so metabolic heat from the core of the body will be essentially trapped and the body will begin to overheat and become hypothermic. 
If this situation is maintained, then dissipation of metabolic heat becomes impossible, and the displacement of blood to the surface of the body may lead to circulatory collapse. However, this quote does not seem to fit with the original paper as intolerable and will result in death in a few hours and not the same thing. And for that matter, around 35 Celsius is not the same as above 35 Celsius. In fact, the suggestion by Sherwood and Hoover here is that the skin temperatures of 37 to 38 Celsius that are fatal are because they induce core body temperatures of 42 to 43 Celsius. The acceptance of 42 to 43 Celsius core body temperatures being fatal seems to be fairly widespread. However, this statement raises another question which is not answered here. And that question is, why is a wet bulb of 35 Celsius being used by M. et al. as a fatal wet bulb temperature if it is a skin temperature of 37 to 38 Celsius that will lead to fatal core temperatures of 42 to 43 Celsius? This is getting exhausting. But to answer these questions, we are appointed to a bunch of references, so let's dive into these. First is Bynum 1978 et al. Uh, in general, the critical thermal maximum defined as the minimal high deep body temperature that is lethal for humans has been accepted as a rectal temperature in the range of 41.6 to 42 Celsius. However, they state that some cancer patients have been maintained under general anesthesia at rectal temperatures of 42 Celsius for up to eight hours without persistent side effects. They're referencing Petty Crew 1974, which I show you here if you want to pursue this further. At this point, it seemed fair to accept that 35 Celsius wet bulb temperatures might be fatal, as stated by Emmett Hall 2017, and implied by the BBC article. But there was something still bothering about this discrepancy between the 35 Celsius and the needed 37 Celsius skin temperatures for fatal core body temperatures. A final look back at Sherwood and Huber revealed a referral to supplementary materials. In these, a surprise a more in-depth explanation of the reasoning for choosing 35 Celsius as their intolerable value. But more importantly, this sentence, which I think can be simply quoted, given standard values for human resting metabolic rate, mass, specific heat, and surface area, wet bulb temperatures of 37 Celsius would lead to irreversible heat trauma associated with sustained core temperatures of 42 Celsius within four to six hours of exposure. Now, comparing this quote with the one by Emmett Hall, we seem to have a significant problem, especially since the Sherwood and Huber paper is precisely the paper Emmett Hall are using to justify their claim. It seems to me that the Emmett Hall fatal wet bulb quote fits much better with a wet bulb temperature of 37 Celsius, not 35 Celsius, which undermines the premise of the paper and the BBC article that came from it. Okay, so what does this all mean for the results of the M. et al. study and, by implication, the BBC article? Well, this is the key figure of the M. et al.'s paper, with the left figure representing the highest six hourly wet bulbs in the 1976 to 2005 current uh, scenario, so sort of a present day uh, situation. The middle and right ones are for 2071 to 2100 into the future. The difference between the two being that the middle one represents a more moderate greenhouse gas scenario, while the one on the right represents the business as usual, high emissions continuing to grow through the 21st century scenario. Let's focus on this high emissions future case, a bad future in other words. The quote from Im et al. is that the wet bulb will exceed their survivability threshold at a few locations across India and Bangladesh in this scenario. You've actually got to zoom in quite close to see these, but let's take a look at Bangladesh. These are the regions where the TW max, the wet bulb temperature, exceeds 35 Celsius in these bad future scenarios. Of course, if we use the 37 Celsius value, there would be no regions at all that exceeded that by the looks of things. Anyway, I'll have to leave the medical side of this issue right now and move on to the question of whether we have ever experienced 35 Celsius or more wet bulb temperatures. The abstract of the Sherber and Huber article states that wet bulb temperatures of above 31 Celsius do not occur anywhere on Earth. But is this really true anymore and was it true back in 2010 anyway? The short answer seems to be no. It is not true and it was not true. Now before we go any further, we have to understand that here that the wet bulb temperature will never be lower than the dew point temperature. 
Assuming that observing practices were maintained correctly, then Bandar Mashar, Iran, on 31st of July 2015, recorded a temperature of 46 Celsius with a dew point temperature of 32 Celsius. This gives a wet bulb temperature of about 34.6 Celsius, well above the 31 Celsius value stated by Sherwood and Huber. So their value seems to have been surpassed since the paper was published. But what about before 2010? Well, going back further to July 8, 2003, Dahran, Saudi Arabia, also on the shores of the Persian Gulf, registered an air temperature of 42 Celsius and a dew point of 35 Celsius. If this observation is correct, it is the highest ever recorded dew point temperature, and it corresponds to a wet bulb temperature of an eye-watering 36 Celsius. But we can go further back in time and find records of observed wet bulb temperatures well above the 31 Celsius value. For example, Sharjah in the United Arab Emirates once recorded a dew point of 34 Celsius, implying a higher wet bulb temperature, likely over 35 Celsius. The date is uncertain, but given this army document was published in 1972, we at least know it was before that. Now, the reason why places close to the coasts of the Arabian Peninsula have experienced the highest wet bulb temperatures is because the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea have the highest sea surface temperatures in the world. But warm temperatures in the Persian Gulf go back a long way. In particular, a sea surface temperature of 35.6 Celsius was recorded on 5th of August 1924 by the SS Frankenfels, and other published values have indicated occurrences of Persian Gulf sea surface temperatures as high as 36.7 Celsius. As well as warm waters, extreme wet bulb temperatures have been associated with nearby agricultural areas because of high rates of evapotranspiration, increasing the near surface air moisture content to extreme levels briefly on certain days. Overall, extreme wet bulb temperatures seem to have already exceeded the 31 Celsius threshold long ago, and it seems that at Dahran it may have already surpassed the significant 35 Celsius value, albeit briefly, in 2003. These observations appear to undermine the narrative that we have never experienced these really high dew points, which is hardly good news, as there is little doubt that if climate model predictions are correct, ocean temperatures and wet bulb temperatures will gradually rise over the next several decades, and so it stands to reason that extreme wet bulb values will rise gradually to become more frequently above this 35 Celsius threshold around the Persian Gulf and then spreading further afield with potentially enormous impacts on the heavily populated Indian subcontinent. Yeah.